What's the word, y'all? Welcome back to Call Game, Kenny for real. Today's a very weird day in the NBA world for a few reasons. I cannot keep up with everything, man. The NBA and the NBPA had a bunch of meetings trying to get the health and regulation rules down to a T to try to prevent the spread of that thing and try to prevent it from entering the NBA deeper than what it is. So they had this meeting and Woj and Shams were dropping bombs left and right with these new rules that NBA players have to abide by. And I'm reading through them and I don't remember a single one of them today. It's going to be hard for me to, to really believe that the 300 players in, in the league got these memos like, OK, I remember everything. And with all of that and then a Kyrie Irving fiasco going on, I just cannot keep up. Shout out to Worldwide Wild for doing the investigative journalism and figuring out everything that's going on with Kyrie. And I mean, I say everything, but really, I think we just know a small portion of what's going on in Kyrie's life. I will say this before we get to the first game of the day and talk about the main subjects. If the video is true, which it seems like it is true of Kyrie Irving being out of the party, even if it is his sister's party and he's out there unmasked and, and violating the rules of the NBA, there should be consequences. I mean, I got on James Harden ass when he was out at the baby shower, what do you want to call it? It's the same thing applies. And I love Kyrie Irving. Kyrie Irving's one of my guys, but there cannot be exceptions. There can be exceptions because one exception can lead to a positive test that can lead to a domino effect. And right now, the NBA is already in a very weird spot with the virus, and it cannot get worse. I don't know what's going on with Kyrie. Obviously, none of us really do. And I'm not here to, to form opinions about Kyrie Irving, the person, or anything like that. Um, I hope he gets everything situated. One thing I can say is I love seeing Kyrie Irving play basketball. And I hope and pray that we will get that back sooner rather than later. Okay? While he wasn't playing, his team was. And that man, Kevin Durant, is a monster. That is not breaking news to a single soul watching this video. But man, to see to not see Kevin Durant basically for two seasons and to see him come out and have a performance like this is ridiculous. And this is what I keep telling to people why everybody on Twitter wants to debate who's better than who. I hate this guy because he he um, challenges my favorite player. All of that has to be cut out, bro. Can we please just accept and appreciate all the great basketball that we can see, man? Because Kevin Durant being at his age, I don't know how many years we have of Kevin Durant being elite. So I'm going to watch every single game, man. 34, we're talking about daggers after dagger, great play after great play. It was a team that was down by, I think, 17 at one point in the first half and had that complete comeback, full 180, and end up having a great game and a, and a win. I, every time now that I see Bruce Brown go out there and ball out in a starting lineup, I am going to feel some type of way because that was me. I'm, gonna get, I'm giving myself that credit. I 100% I know that Steve Nash slash whoever's on the coaching staff doesn't watch these videos. But the day before Bruce Brown got officially a start, I was the one telling him to start Bruce Brown. So I'm taking all of that. And, man, he looked really good today. He is not the solution for their point guard position, for sure. Um, that's where Kyrie Irving would, would definitely fit in. But Bruce Brown definitely helps the flow of the offense a lot. This is the best playmaking I've seen from Kevin Durant. And Kevin Durant, I can't say always has been a very good playmaker, but his last couple years of Washington, he showcased a lot of that with the free-flowingness of the uh, Warriors offense. Today was a great playmaker game because, again, with no Kyrie Irving, no Spencer Dinwiddie, they need somebody to be that guy. It was Kevin Durant. I know his sister turnover ratio was just 2-1, to one, which is something people are talking about on Twitter. Like, can we, can we please get out of stat world and just appreciate the game? Because he hit daggers and he led his team to a comeback. Um, same thing with Tim, Tim, Timothy Luau Cabro, still one of my favorite names to say. And I've been a fan of him since he was on the Bulls. And Karis LeVert had a great game. And Joe Harris is super reliable. On the other side of things, this was a bad loss for the Denver Nuggets. Now, I understand that Denver is missing a few players. Um, they were missing Gary Harris, of course, Michael Porter Jr. I still don't know the news about Michael Porter Jr., but it has to be with the virus and stuff. So he can't play for a while now. Um, um, so they, of course, were shorthanded. They had to start Bobo. And Bobo started off pretty solidly on his defense with Kevin Durant, but got into some foul trouble and then everything. One thing I love is the call um, because Bobo is similar to my boy Patrick Williams where whenever he catches the ball, he's shuffling his feet. And he could probably get called for a travel every single time. He doesn't get called every single time, but he probably could. And on the call, they said, Bobo, travel traveled. And I just, I, it made me giggle in, in real time. It's not funny now, but it made me giggle in real time. Um, when I was watching this game, and pretty much the last couple games where the Denver Nuggets have been struggling, I realized that I, I severely underrated the losses 
they had this offseason. I knew that Jeremy Grant going off to another team, Mason Plumlee going off to another team would hurt the team, but I didn't expect it to be this significant. And again, I don't want to overreact because I just mentioned they're missing two starters right now, but when you're up by double digits, especially when it's closest to 20, in a lot of situations, it's, it has to be a collapse for you to lose this. And part of this, I don't care that Jamal Murray ended with 20 points. This did not feel like a good game from Jamal Murray. Jamal Murray is in the similar conversation with Pascal Siakam, and I, I want people to hear this and interpret this the right way because people are weird out there where they make the game look so much more difficult than it has to be both of them very great NBA players very great basketball players but the reason why maybe these players get a little bit more criticism than they probably deserve is because instead of taking the easy basket they have to do a side step back a spin move whatever it may be to take their heart a basket and what makes these guys great is because they, they do hit these shots at the end of the day but when they're not hitting these shots, it is difficult. There's a lot of times in these games where I'm watching Jamal Murray in a, in a Jokic pick and roll, and Jokic with these big body screens, Jamal Murray is very open for a shot, but he doesn't look for the shot off the pick and roll. He's looking for the playmaking situation instead of just taking the easy one. Take the pull-up mid-range jumper. And then in other cases, <laughs> when he's not open, he wants to do the sidestep jumper. It's, it's very weird. He's not playing with the same confidence that we saw in the bubble, and I knew we weren't going to get the bubble version of Jamal Murray as far as like statistically of him being like a superstar player but I wanted to see that confidence from the bubble whether the shots were going or not and we did not see that today we just didn't um PJ Dozier got way too many minutes for my liking but I understand they were shorthanded I I that, that, that's the end of that and that was a lot of time on the first game let's go to the other game where two teams were basically at seven and eight total players on their roster and that is the Miami Heat versus the 76ers and it took all of Joel Embiid for them to pull out this win I've been seeing people talk about the refing I don't want to do that I just want to focus on Joel Embiid putting up 45 16 and 4 and if I'm not mistaken this is the second game of a back-to-back -back for him it was where they end up losing last night Joel Embiid back-to-back -back games, y'all. He played. And the, this one was a good one, and they needed every single one of that. The, the, there was a clip that came out of uh, Danny Green last game. He shot 0 for 9, and he was interacting with fans, and he was like, I got three rings. And he showed that three rings, I guess. He got so many shot attempts because, again, the team was so short-handed. I, I would I would bet a lot of money that 25 shot attempts is the most shot attempts Danny Green has had in a regulation game. But it ended up with 29 points in the win. And the win. Uh, for the Miami Heat, obviously, they were super, super shorthanded. Like, at least the Philadelphia 76ers had their two all-NBA all-star caliber players playing. And Ben Simmons fouled out, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, he ended up fouling out. Um, but Miami was missing all of that. No Jimmy Butler, no Bam Adebayo. They had two, I guess they had three starters technically because Kelly Olenek has been their starter for them. And Tyler Hero just, just did his thing. Pressure 2 just did his thing. Duncan Robinson just did his thing. This, was, this is a game that the Miami Heat fans should be stepping away and be like, this is a good game for us. All things considered, good game for us. But one thing that I'm afraid of is that when we have these people and these teams super shorthanded, whether it be to the injuries or due to the virus, I would be so afraid that my team, instead of being the four seed, end up the five seed because of that one to two games that we had six to seven players. You know what I'm saying? Like, imagine, and I know home court advantage is kind of not a thing this season, but imagine losing home court advantage because of the two games three months ago where we only had seven players. Or a team that was the sixth seed or was the seventh seed now have to play a play-in game because they lost two games when they only had seven players. You get what I'm saying? There's like real implications that can go through with the standings when we have all of these teams missing so many players. Next game I want to talk about. I mean, I don't want to talk about this. Jazz end up winning against the Cavaliers. And people are asking me in yesterday's video, why didn't I talk about the Cavaliers? Bro, y'all are missing like six players to injury. Y'all had to pull a guy off of the street and Yogi Ferrell and throw him into the lineup today. So I'm not really watching and examining your games because you're missing two of your best players. I'm just not going to talk about y'all because y'all had a game. Just I'll wait till everybody get... <laughs> Yogi Ferrell came in and shot 12 shots. <laughs> That's funny. I'm, I'm going to wait for y'all to get healthy again and we're going to talk back about the Cavs. Uh, Lakers, Rockets, LeBron is a beast. Um, a lot of a lot of noise about the Rockets right now because of some of the things James Harden said after the game and, and John Wall retaliating. And this is funny because it's coming after a report from Kev Kevin O'Connor a few days ago basically saying that there is still some chance where they can reconcile this relationship and get James Harden to stay at least for the remainder of the season and then they'll decide what to do in the offseason but the way this man is talking he is trying to get out as soon as possible and this was the most 
vocal he has been throughout this whole thing where he was just saying that he's done everything he can he can for Houston and to a point he is 100% correct he's giving it all f- for Houston um but it it was weird me and my boy was talking about it like when was the last time we saw James Harden not putting up 30s like his last couple games game log he's not putting up 30s like think think about that he's not putting up 30s 15 15 20 and 16 the first game he had like 40 something right and we were like oh James Harden's still really good he just doesn't care too much he just doesn't care too much right now and everybody else on the team other than him and PJ Washington are trying to go out there fight every night keep their contracts contribute and these are two guys that are holding the the, the um the locker room back and if I'm the front office I'm trying to ship these guys out as soon as possible but obviously you're trading a franchise superstar player so you don't want to just accept trash the front office, the coaching, the locker room is in a very weird spot, and they have to figure it out, I think, as soon as possible. And with some of the teams out there that are struggling, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a trade sooner rather than later. I'm hoping for a trade soon, but we, we will never know. The Lakers are a team that we don't end up talking about too much because I think we all can agree they are still the favorite, and I'm not watching them and seeing them lose a game here and there and trying to overly analyze what they're doing. They're playing fine, and they look like the best team in the league still. Even with them coasting, they still like the best team in the league. Spurs and the and the Thunder, my only takeaway from this is that Shea Gilles Alexander should shoot more shots. A couple games ago, he had like a 30-point game and, and helping them to win. And I know that winning may not be the prime objective here, um, but I think he ended up with like 10 shots. He needs to at least shoot 18, 19, 20. And maybe I'm bugging, but I, I want him to be a little bit more aggressive tonight specifically, even though the other nights he was. Spurs get a good win, and I think that they have a positive record on this road trip, which is a good thing, man. This is a team that was kind of down, and now I think they lost four games in a row and started to put together 4-1 and one in their last five. Great. And the Pacers and the Warriors, before we end off this episode, the Pacers show um their elite level like a couple nights ago maybe it was exactly last night they folded um they they had a comeback against the the Sacramento Kings and they folded last minute today was not one of those days and they went on this big old run at the end of the fourth quarter to close it out against the Warriors big game for Miles Turner which is so great to see that he is playing with the utmost amount of confidence um and I feel like a lot of Pacers fans were trying to get him out of the team over the past couple seasons and I feel like they probably changed their mind. No Victor Oladipo. Summers comes in and he plays very well, slashing and not missing at the basket. And Malcolm Brogdon have his best game, probably his worst game of the season, and they were still able to get a quality win. And that's still including Demontis Sabonis struggling because Draymond had that thing on clamps. Speaking of clamps, they ran this um this box and one against Steph Curry, and they prevented him from having a great Steph Curry game. I think that the best thing that could have happened for the Warriors this season is Wiggins turning into a defensive player. Draymond Green talked about it as soon as they traded D'Angelo Russell for Wiggins in that pick that that he wants to try to help Wiggins become an all defensive type player and a lot of people me included thought that those ship that ship has has sailed considering he had been in the league for so long. This season he has been amazing defensively, and I'm not talking about his five blocks. I'm talking about deeper than that. His defense has been amazing this season, and that is great because I, I didn't want to give up on Wiggins, but if this might have been the season. If he had another stick over a year, this might have been the season where I finally, finally gave up, and I'm so happy that he has changed the narrative about him because it used to be if Wiggins wasn't hitting the shots, he wasn't doing anything for you. And now it's not that anymore. Even if Wiggins is not hitting a shot, his defense is good now. His defense is good now. And it's great. That's all I have to say about today. Um, If you did enjoy the video, be sure to leave a like, man. And I'll be back probably tomorrow. I wish my Bulls would have played, but the Bulls Twitter account did a great way of bringing back old memories, showing old highlights of Bulls basketball since we couldn't actually get a game today. So shout out to the social media team over there. Uh, Hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave it a like, subscribe, call the game.